Thank you all for coming out. Um, I'm still trying to decide what day it is. And uh, the mayor wasn't kidding. I may just stay here <laughs> come November 9th, depending on how things go. But anyway, it's, a, it's an interesting time in our country. We all look at ourselves in the mirror and go, what are we thinking? But <laughs> and I have had more conversations with people from other countries going, what are you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I'm there with you. Um, it's great. Uh, I appreciate the mayor, um, mayor's comments. Um, let's see if this is actually going to go. Nope. Back over here. Um, so I'm with a firm called uh, Amick Foster Wheeler, and yes, we are Aussies. We're in all these cities. I don't know everything that we do in those various offices, but architectural and multifunctional engineering kind of design. I know we do a lot of that. Um, so I'm out of Nashville, Yeehaw, Tennessee, and uh, great to go out and hear good country music down by the park last night and sit around and meet those folks. And they all, I say, oh, you're a Yank, where are you from, Nashville? Oh, and then the music guys always go, are you a, and I go, no. I'm, an, I'm, an enge I'm on tour, <laughs> engineering tour. Um, interesting to talk about the, um, uh, situation here is so I've done a lot of reading and uh, I have been doing storm got sucked into stormwater in 1973 before some of you were born I, I am, was reminded yesterday um, but um, I have a couple of takeaways um, you have the same sort of problems that we have I mean it's water is water and water scarcity is water scarcity parts of our country have water scarcity issues California in particular it was hammered and then the Santa Ana's dumped more rain and water than they imagined. Now the reservoirs are full, and now we're thinking about other things and watering our lawns again. It's like, oh, wake up. Um, the other thing is that um, you have a much more detail. U.S., we tend to shoot from the hip a little bit more and then apologize for our mistakes later, November 10th, say. But um, so there's lots of great ideas out there. But the actual approach to take this aggregate of, of studies and ideas and, and actually bring about a change is sort of been left to local governments to figure out. There's lots of hand-waving. You guys have more studies and more papers and more stuff about change, but, but how do we bring about actual change? And that's kind of where we were back in the, in the 70s. How do we take this stuff? and create a sustainable stormwater program? How do we, how do we shift gears from stormwater as sort of the, the redheaded stepchild at the water family reunion? You have you know, water, which is the doctor from Harvard, and you have sewer, which is the lawyer from Yale, and then you have stormwater, who's the kid who dropped out of college, hitchhiked across Europe, went and studied with Nepalese monks, and now lives with the parents in the basement. You know, I mean, that, that's sort of been stormwater. It's always a sort of afterthought sort of a thing. Um, and uh, the mayor referred to something that, that we call the hydroillogical cycle, and I think we all know what the hydrologic cycle is, rainfall, runoff, evapotranium, run. The hydroillogical cycle works like this. Flooding, panic, planning, procrastination. And so we go round and round that cycle because once we get done with planning and we look at the price tag, and we look at the fact that it's not raining today. Today, every stormwater system in Brisbane is working great. Every single one of them is flawless. And so uh, if a water main broke today, it would be fixed within a couple of hours. But we don't have any idea how many of our stormwater mains are out there uh, broken right now, just waiting for a storm to test them and to be found wanting and something collapses or something floods. We don't know that, and so it's, it's hard to make that point. Um, so I think that some of the things that have been done in the states would be beneficial. You guys are way far ahead of the U.S. in your WISID or WISID. We don't call it that, but um, it seems funny to call something SUDS that's supposed to be clean water. But anyway, um, so we call it green infrastructure, low impact design, and it's it's still sort of a sort of a wild west kind of a thing in many parts of the state. So some cities are way down the road and they've been doing it. Some states have. And then EPA gets sued by the home builders and they back off and then a new administration. And then, so we don't have the coordinated plan that you have uh, to try to field 
this thing is sort of the new paradigm for stormwater management. But I do want to talk about some of the experiences. So what I thought I would do is touch very briefly on a, on a few cities that I've worked in, and I want to talk about two things. I want to talk about um, the, the two things that together radically change the ability of local governments within the United States to cause their stormwater programs to come to maturity, to, to stop being the kid in the basement without a job, and to you know get a job, get married, buy a house, and have kids. You know, that is sort of, and sort of did that for stormwater. And so um, I want to talk to you about, about how stormwater grew up. And so let me give a couple of examples. So the first one is Cleveland. So Cleveland had this, the river that caught fire. I don't know if you remember. Uh, and so what do you put it out with? You know, water? I mean, <laughs> that's not going to work. And it also had um, 58 cities mutually flooding each other, mutually, you know, the statue to the stormwater manager in this area would be this. You know, it's like, not my job, not my responsibility. <clears throat> and so in this particular case, um, the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District decided to take on stormwater and manage the trunk system for stormwater. And so we went through a very detailed process of what are the significant issues, how do we solve those issues, what are the drivers for those issues, why do they keep reoccurring, how, do we, how are we fair to all of the cities. It, it took about a year and a half, um, but now it's set up, no rivers catch fire, Lake Erie is being cleaned up rapidly, and it has one of the finest green infrastructure programs probably in the country, and all 58 cities, after three of them sued and lost at the Ohio Supreme Court, now they're all singing Kumbaya together, and actually really appreciating the fact that there is money being invested across the region in a very fair way, solving intercity stormwater flooding problems, actually solving them. So it, it turned out really well. Um, Charlotte had 10,000 drainage complaints and no way to solve any of them. These were legitimate drainage complaints. And so uh, again, we said, okay, why do we have all these complaints? Where do they come from? What are the causes? And what are the root causes? Not just we have a, you know, because it fell in or it's clogged, but no, why does that keep happening? Why do we have 10,000 instead of 100? And in Charlotte, we ended up setting up a, a very detailed business plan, which then eventuated in a funding program. The business plan was sold to city council, who were all business people, and the mayor sold it to the public as a business plan for stormwater infrastructure. And, and the public went, huh. So it wasn't kind of, so I'm geeky, okay, I used to teach hydrology at Vanderbilt, did, did modeling and stuff, but, but it wasn't a geeky plan, it was a plan that citizens could go, oh, okay, I, I get that. This is a smart plan. And then we backed it up with funding. Charlotte solved 10,000 drainage complaints in two and a half years. It worked so well, the mayor told me personally, he said, I never thought stormwater would make me a hero. I never thought I would say that. It always has made me a goat. And so the problems were resolved. Mecklenburg County, which we have counties and cities, so cities are nestled within counties. Um, Mecklenburg County set one up, they, they shook hands, they agreed. And then all of the local governments, the, the city and the county together went to them and said, you can add a surcharge onto our fee if you want to. We'll bill it for you and we'll give you all the money. And the city said, what's not to like about that? This is free money and you take the hit for the fee. And so all of the cities signed up. Some of them handed their program lock, stock and barrel to the county. Some handed part of it and kept part of it. Today, this is one of the most successful stormwater programs in the country. This was set up in 92. They have almost no flooding problems, and now the money is being spent for greenways, walking trails, um, daylighting of streams that were put under pipes. They have beautiful parks now, and it's all stormwater. It's all stormwater related. Denver area, multiple cities not talking to each other, explosive growth, little coordination. In this case, the state created a separate organization called the Denver Urban Drainage and Flood Control District. It was created by special legislation. It actually has taxing authority. And its job is to pick up the drainage, I don't know how many hectares this is, but probably 127.3 hectares, 300 acres of drainage. And downstream, Denver Urban Drainage owns all that, coordinates all that, 
It supervises all development. It does regional controls. It does flood control across the whole area. All of the large streams are theirs. And then it handshakes at that boundary with all the small governments. Works wonderfully. Um, started out with a very detailed plan and then funding followed that. Last example I want to give is Nashville. This was a streets department that suddenly, it was a small town streets department that got faced with a city that became a million people in a very short period of time. But it was a bunch of streets guys who finally faced with water quality and planning and green infrastructure, threw up their hands and said, we have no idea what to do. So we came in and went through a very detailed public process and eventually we moved stormwater over with water and sewer. And we created a water resource organization because stormwater looks and smells more like water and sewer than it does like police and schools and fire and everything else you pay for with taxes. We created a user fee and today Nashville's, I hope it's today because, wait, what day is it? Tomorrow for us, no, today for us, but tomorrow for them, council's going to hear an increase in the fee because they've done so well solving problems. They can literally go from complaint to construction in two days if they need to. So that's a, that's, yeah, you go, see, I see eyes going, what? How do they do that? There, there's just a very quick contracting design process and bam, stuff gets fixed right away. So it's, it's a pretty amazing. Um, we actually ran their program for a number of years and designed and built 8,000 projects across the city. Very quick, all paid for by a stormwater user fee. So in each of these examples, a multi-layered program analysis led to a business plan that eventually led to financing that led to a, a successful program. We followed this thought process. It's called the Harvard Change Model. <clears throat> Very simple, if it's hard, none of us could figure it out. Your ability to bring about permanent transient, uh, um, not transient, permanent change, sort of ground shift change, is dependent on this equation, D times V times P. D is your ability to clear and compellingly describe the problems you're trying to solve in ways that people can accept and understand and go, yeah, I resonate with that, that you're talking my language. V is how clearly and compellingly you can make a vision for the outcomes and outputs for the future. And P is how good of a plan do you have that people go, that plan will work. If you have a great description of the problem in numerous reports, which you have, and a pretty good description of what different ways of treating stormwater looks like, you've got a 10 and a 10. But if your P, your actual practical plan to get there is a zero, 10 times 10 times zero is zero. And we're back in the, in the uh, hydrological cycle. And so the, the question then is, is how do we break out of that? So let me give an example just using flooding real quickly. So someone comes to you, they're screaming. When people are flooded, they don't care. They, I was the stormwater engineer for Nashville for one day because he resigned and they asked me if I'd step in. Honestly, that's the hardest job on earth when there's a flood because it was in the middle of a flood. So why is there flooding? Um, if we ask uh, some questions, so you, this is either a tombstone or a head wall, right? Maybe it's the tombstone for the uh, maintenance crew. Um, this is, uh, well, you know what this is. That, that used to be a culvert. Um, not anymore, water uh, uh, went past it. Um, little hint on the sign there, Fairview Restaurant, why did this flood? Right on the banks of the gurgling river until you got a big flood. So if you ask the question, and this is something called the five whys. We use this all the time to get to the bottom and to structure solutions. Because when you read a lot of reports, there are solutions hanging out there in air, and each one sounds good, but how do I fit them together into a plan? This process will do that. So why do we have flooding problems? There's always five ways, five reasons why we have flooding. And it's always some combination of those five things. The system's not working, it's clogged or damaged. Buildings are in the wrong place. The system was sized wrong to begin with. Or the system was sized right and upstream flooding has increased, upstream discharge has increased. Or we just had a big storm. If Noah floats by, we will all be in a floodplain. Okay, so there's... We're a little different than probably the, uh, the largest flow, your wastewater system 
uh, will ever experience is just after the running of the Melbourne Cup, right? When everybody goes and then they come back, right? And so that will happen, you know, next week. Um, so we ask one more why question. Why are systems clogged down? Well, duh. We don't know their condition or we don't maintain them if we do know their condition. Buildings are located wrong because we don't keep them out. We don't have the right regulatory authorities to keep them out. Poor design. We don't assess the impact downstream. We, we would never, we don't do streets this way. We, we do transportation studies when we do new development, but we don't do downstream stormwater studies. We just keep building. Um, and uh, more rainfall. Um, well, there's lots of reasons for that, but one could be climate change. You ask the next why question, why don't we do these things? We always get down to three things. Our authority structure to do it is scattered across various levels and various departments. It's not coherent or it doesn't exist. We don't have the authority to do what we need to do. Secondly, we don't have a plan. Now, this isn't a business plan. This is actually a technical master plan. We don't know where to start, what to fix, and what we'll do, what to each other. And thirdly, and in yellow, we don't have funding. And I'm going to get right back to that. Why don't we have those things? We don't have those things because of political support and public understanding and support. Why don't we have political and public understanding? Because we have been unable to articulate a vision and a direction that motivates people to support us. We have seen the problem, and it's us. Um, people don't care about stormwater till they do. And, and it's, it's up to us who do care about it to find ways to motivate people down at that lower level. So when I think about the five whys, and you can use these five whys on why your child is flunking in school, OK? But it'll eventually point to you, OK? I'm just saying, so you might not want to try that. But you can use it for anything, OK? It's a, called total quality management, the five whys. But it works really well in stormwater because when I look at these things, I can then come up with a series of, and I'll just pop all these up quickly, I can come up with a series of solutions that create an integrated program business plan. If I do those set of things in the right order over time, I will have solved the institutional issues and I will have solved the physical issues and everything in between. You can see at the bottom, everything is institutional. At the top, everything is physical. In the middle, it's kind of half and half. If we don't solve the institutional issues, we will forever be dealing with the physical issues at the top. We have to resolve the issues down there. The two things that are key are the two things in yellow, getting, we'll call it safe flooding, stay safe flooding, right, safe funding, that was Freudian, safe funding, and a business plan, which is different than a master plan. And then I have champs, which is champions. We need champions. Like the, I was so glad to see the mayor here. She is a champion for stormwater in her city, and she can get tons done, way more than uh, a yank and a spell guy can get done, right? <clears throat> okay, so let's shift to funding. So let's say I have a business plan, and that business plan lays out lots of things. Now we're going to look at how we set up this funding mechanism and how do we pay for it. There's about 100, actually there's 182 methods that I have seen and know of to pay for stormwater management, but they're not all created equal. There are three kinds of things that we have. We have resources, we have money, and we have revenue. If you think about your own private world, uh, a resource might be your neighbor's lawnmower, right? It's free to you. People donate it, whatever. Money is one time, unpredictable, episodic. A relative dies and leaves you a lawnmower. Okay, that's your lawnmower, but when it's gone, there won't be another lawnmower. It happened because something else happened. Okay, that's money. Revenue is, I don't know, my son starts his own lawn maintenance company and just says, Dad, I'll mow your lawn forever. Okay, so, so revenue is like your paycheck. It's great if we get a government refund or we get a Christmas present of $50 in an envelope, but none of that will pay my monthly mortgage. None of that will pay my electric bill. I need revenue. And in the same way, out of those 178 ways of paying for stormwater, there's only two kinds of revenue. There's only two ways to get revenue. Revenue is either tax-based revenue or it's user fee-based revenue. 
There's only two ways of getting revenue. Now, tax base can be franchise fees, it can be special assessment districts, it can be property taxes, it can be a number of ways of, of taxing. In Las Vegas, they pay for it out of gambling proceeds. Um, but there's just two ways of revenue. And when we get right down to it, if taxes would have solved the problem, it already would have solved the problem. We wouldn't be here, I wouldn't be here. Taxes doesn't solve the problem because when we compete for taxes, stormwater always loses. You, you get tax revenue to solve a flooding problem two months after a flood, and then the money dries up when the storm dries up, and I'm back to not having money again. So years ago, back in 74, somebody in the US said, we need to think of stormwater like we think of water and wastewater. It is a water utility. I don't pay my wastewater bill based on property value. I pay for it on the basis of use. Can we set up stormwater to pay on the basis of use? So the idea came of a stormwater utility. So here's a typical house, and it has drinking water, and it has wastewater, and it has stormwater. There are three systems that serve every property, three water systems. And the property owner would say, that's mine. If that breaks, I fix it. It's my responsibility. But they would say, that's not mine. That's public. And if that breaks, I call somebody to fix it. If that wastewater main at the top broke and somebody called, you would never hear the customer service person say, sorry, it's not on the right of way. I can't fix it. Why? Because that's not the way they think about it. They think about, I have a system. It's a public system. It's my system. Every part of that system is mine, and I capitalize it, and I maintain it, and I plan it, and I operate it, and I operate the whole system. It's my system. But in stormwater, we think parcel-based, not system-based, typically at this point in time. But customers don't. Citizens don't. If they're flooded, it kind of doesn't matter what your policies are. It matters if you can help them. That, that's really all that matters. So what is a stormwater utility? It's a, it's a mix of funding methods, but the primary one is user fee. First of all, it's just a way to get money. That's all it is. We used to get money, not very much, from taxes. Now we get adequate funding from a user fee, a stormwater user fee. There's 2,100 of these in the US right now. Probably 50 in development, even as we speak. I'm working on seven different ones right now. But if you're charging somebody a line item on a bill for something they thought they got for free, you better do a better job, right? Don't start a user fee and send all the tax money away and offer the same bad service we had before. So you better do a better job. So when somebody calls, the stormwater utility will take care of that. Oh yeah, the utility came, the utility plan. Okay, it's got a logo, it's, it's real. It's not just vaporware, it, it, this is a real thing. And finally, it can be, but doesn't have to be in organizational entities. In small towns, it tends to be a person who's in the public works department or whatever you call it. But in large communities, it might be a whole stormwater organization that's established. But what we're not doing is, is creating a bureaucracy. What we're creating is funding to solve problems in the community. That's what we're doing. Funding and, a, and an organizational program. Um, why is a stormwater user fee better? This is the argument you make, okay? This is where it comes up with SAFE. The advantages of a stormwater user fee form of funding this is like, look into the men in black, poof, no new taxes, poof, never Trump. Okay, just keep. <laughs> Safe, stable, adequate, flexible, equitable. We have a big fight in our house because I have two very redneck sons, so it's a fun. Ex uh. um, when I say stable, this is, this is how stormwater funding works under tax-based funding. You're always in the trough. You can never get above the dotted line except on occasion, but you can never plan. You can't do a 10-year capital plan because you need storms to fund a 10-year capital plan, right? And if storms are the reason for funding, it's not very predictable. But a stormwater user fee is stable, and not only is it stable, but every time a new development occurs, your revenue goes up. Why? Because they're generating revenue. So it grows right along with community growth. You set it right at the first time, and you're off to the races. If you're growing fast, it grows fast. So it's stable. You can use this money to do a 10-year plan. You can tell Aunt Minerva when you're going to fix her drainage problem. You can get matching funds from various, well, in the US, 
the first utility we set up in the state of Georgia, they had 1.2 million in revenue, it's a small town, 27,000, 1.2 million in revenue, but every year for the first five years, they use that revenue to get matching funds to the tune of $800,000 a year every single year. Then about 17 other communities in Georgia set up user fees to get that money, and it dwindled a bit. But um, how much is the typical fee per month in Australian dollars? Um, now, this is actually in US dollars, 2013, but you can see the range. So I'm not talking about charging, so, and let's talk about per month, because we think in those terms. So the average is in 2013 is 420, it's probably 475 now, something like that. So that's like a latte with an extra shot. You know, it, it's, it's not, it'd be like a, a good beer, you know. Uh, so, so it's not like a, it's not breaking the bank kinds of money. And this is for a typical residence. You can see that it ranges, Detroit is the highest, I'm working up in Detroit, boy, is that interesting place to work. Housing stock for 2.4 million, population of 650,000. It is like a dystopian future, you know, it's like Blade Runner or something up there. Some, some days it feels like interesting place to live, or not live, but work. Um, but you can see that there's a range of fees and every community is different. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a test. Now, let's assume that we did a really good job communicating to people that all this money would go to solve compelling problems that we know. Think about your community, not you personally, but your community, and I'm going to pop up some numbers per month that the typical residential charge will be. When I get to the number where you go, that's about as high as I think our community would ever go, or people I know would go, raise your hand. And let's just see where we'll be, okay? Everybody got it? Okay, so here we go. I'll start. Now, if you think, heck no, I don't think any is enough, pretend you're not that person, okay? Just be a person who at least some amount is okay. Okay, so we got $2. That's as high as we go, no higher, a month per typical household. Okay, you can be the cheap person. I mean, that's all right, you can, you can raise your hand. Okay, I should, okay, I know, I, <laughs> I was gonna point to you. Okay, four dollars, four and no higher. Okay, six and no higher, okay. Yeah, so maybe 20%, uh, 25% of the room. Eight and no higher. Okay, now we're probably up to 70% of the room. $10 a month, no higher. Okay, so now we've got almost everybody. 12 and above, a couple of yes, okay, very good. Okay, so our average in here is probably $7, somewhere in there, six or $7. Here's a really cool thing. This is how much stormwater programs cost. Uh, I changed it to hectares, by the way. Um, dollars per developed hectare per year. This is based on about 100 communities in the US, translated over here. And so if you want a moderate stormwater program, which is like a low mileage Range Rover with leather seats and the tires aren't that great. Okay, so, so it's, it's not a fancy program, but it's, it, it can go the distance kind of a program. You'd be in the moderate. Advanced is we're doing a, a lot more with SUD kinds of things. Our master planning is better. Exceptional is Look, trout can spawn in our streams downtown, okay? So, and look, Bellevue, Washington, that was their goal. We're gonna light culverts so salmon can spawn in downtown Bellevue, Washington. And they did, and they do. Um, here's the cool thing about this idea. For every $1 per month that you charge residences, and equal charges, and I'll show you how that works in a minute, for non-residential, that is bigger charges depending on how big they are, you can generate between $60 and $100 per hectare per year for every $1. So $1 will give you an incidental program, but $5 will get you that Range Rover program. In other words, I can stay at least $2 or $3 below your screen level and have a program that's not bad. At $8, I can, I can be up in that kind of between modern and advanced. At 12, I'm up well into an advanced stormwater program. In other words, this stormwater user fee works so well because it generates significant dollars in a way that people go, you know what, if you do a really good job of showing you what it will be used for, okay, it's not a big deal. But don't lie, you know, it's like, don't lie to me. Okay, so it works pretty well. So here's Brisbane. I just did some rules of thumb. I think for a $5 fee, Brisbane could generate 50 or $60 million a year, which is a 
pretty hefty amount of money for stormwater. Year in, year out, you could do bonding, you could accelerate, cat. You, could, you can do a lot of things with 50 or 60 million, and that would be $5 a year per residence and then higher charge, I'll show you how it works for commercial in a minute. So, not bad. So F, flexible. You can use a stormwater fee for anything that looks and remotely smells like stormwater, including triple bottom line benefits, parks, greenway trails, street sweeping, tanks, um, doing incentives for people to, you can, you can share the cost of a rainwater harvesting system in commercial or residential properties. You can say, we'll pay half, you pay half. A lot of communities in the states do that now, using their stormwater user fee money. You can incentivize good behavior. You can give credits for people who design um, facilities that solve flooding problems downstream. You can give them a healthy credit against their fee. So now I have carrots, not just sticks, for the stormwater program. I can take into account any kinds of costs, and then I can do other fees. For example, developer, what do we call them? Infrastructure development fees. Infrastructure charges can fit in under this rate structure so that certain activities that cause the city money are paid for by the person that causes that demand on the system. It's not shifted to all rate payers. Remember, they're rate payers, not taxpayers. This isn't a rain tax. It's a user fee, okay? It, if you think of it like a water bill or a sewer bill, you're there. How does it work? Let's say that a typical residence is 200 square meters of impervious area, rooftop, sidewalk, driveway. We'll call that an equivalent residential unit. And that is our billing unit. Why? Because people resonate with that. It's like, wait a minute. So the man who's got a house twice as big as me in a tennis court is paying twice what I'm paying? I like this. You know, I like it. The man is paying, you know? I like that. And so it's, it's kind of got that feel to it where how many ERUs does your property have? How many times bigger than the normal homeowner is your property in terms of impervious area? Impervious area is the typical choice to measure use of the stormwater system. Why is that? Because, okay, geek act. Because when you look at modeling of all different kinds, whether it's water quality modeling, flood modeling, water volume modeling, continuous simulation, impervious area, and particularly directly connected impervious, is the best indicator of how much water runs off. That is how much you use the system downstream, how much impact you have. And so 86% of all stormwater utilities use impervious area or some measure of impervious, or impervious plus gross, right? If I have a big forest, should I pay anything? And that's all I have? Some people say no, because the forest isn't the problem. It's when I develop the forest, that's the problem. Some people say yes, because water does run off a of forest too and gets into the street system. The owner of the forest says, look, you all invaded my space, man. You should pay me because, you know, your trash is blowing into my forest. So, so there's lots of arguments there, but typically impervious area is the way that it goes. So how's the fee calculated? If I'm 40 times as big as that one house, I pay 40 times as much. So if they pay $5, I pay $90, right? Is that, is that right? Five times 40? Yeah, 90, okay. So, so I'd pay nine. Say so it's still not a killer for a business. It's not like 5,000 for a, a business that size. It's 90 bucks. Plus they get a credit. If they have detention, if they have WSUD, if they have other things, if they have rain barrel or, or a rain tank, we give them generous credits. Why? Because they're trying to incentivize that. Um, <clears throat> so here's some typical properties. $4 uh, charge. Fast food, $62. Big shopping mall, $1,200. They spend more on toilet paper, honestly. So, so it's... Again, it's not, a, it's not a big fee, it's not shockingly big, except for, and here's a couple tiers of residential. You don't wanna be out there measuring at Minerva's new patio, so we just say high or low, or low, medium, and high, something like that. Um, and you just throw them in buckets and off you go. Um, so, uh, so that's how it works. So there's obviously a need to measure this and, and sort this out. Uh, pretty straightforward kind of a thing. Let's talk about how do we go about setting that up. This is sort of where the rubber meets the road. So, so are you sold on the idea? Everybody, everybody's, okay, some of you are sold. Some of you are voting for Trump, though. <laughs> <coughs> um, I have to stop with the Trump jokes. Um, how do you go about setting one of these things up? Um, first of all, 
you have to know why you're doing it. You have to make a compelling, logical case. When we were talking with the mayor, um, she said, this is all great and I love the idea, but boy, you gotta convince people we're doing something real. And I said, bingo. You put your finger right on the thing. It has to be compelling and logical. There are lots of drivers for action, but are they compelling? Right? If you see a bomb technician running, you're not going to ask a lot of questions. You're going to run, right? You know, if you see kids running, you're wondering what they stole, right? So, so it, 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 we, we have to ask, is this compelling? And how do we come up with compelling cases? Well, people are left brain and the right brain. In South Denver, when we set up this utility across all of South Denver, we literally had the secret weapon, the articulate flooded mother with a video. And she stood before city council with her video of her patio furniture being washed away and her kids screaming in the background. And the mayor said, this will never happen again in our community. And we're doing like high fives under the table and asking ourselves, how can we change your name and like bring her to every community you know, that we do? I mean, can, can we, can, you know, maybe a video. But see, that, that did it, that sold people. But some people are like, yeah, that's fine, you know, it's kids, you know, but wait, what's our backlog? What are, wait, where, are, where is this backlog? Now, what's generating this backlog? You know, so that's us, right? So, so we have left brain and right brain, and so we need to make a logical and an emotional pitch. Here's a typical logic for, for our brains, okay? We have real, growing, and unresolved problems. And you can give all the data you want, pictures, horror stories, and people go, okay, I'm convinced. We can resolve them and we have a good plan. What's your plan? Okay, so we have D and V, right, in DVP, okay? Harvard change model. We can resolve them, we have a good plan. The government must lead, individual citizens cannot solve flooding problems. They can clear their gutter, that's about it. We have to take lead. Local government probably has to lead, it can get some support, but honestly. There will be benefits, it will be worth it. We can quantify and qualify the benefits. It will cost more than we're spending now. Just be right up front honest. It'll cost more than we're spending now. Among the options to generate revenue, a user fee is by far the best option. I got this far one time in a place in South Carolina where they don't normally cuss in public. And uh, <clears throat> the mayor goes, damn it, right in a public meeting. And I was like, what? And he goes, you got me. He said, I agree with every point you made, I just don't want to do this. <laughs> Which was really honest in front of you know, God and the television and all the people. He said, I just don't want to do this, but we need to. I mean, we would, we would be betraying our stewardship responsibility of this infrastructure if we don't solve these problems. He said, when is the election? You know, I mean, so, there, there's, so you create this angst, but the logic is sort of irrefutable logic. And if we ignore the problem, guess what? We'll be back in three years, in two years. We'll be back the first time a school bus plunges into a ditch and gets washed off a road. We'll be back. You don't want that to be your driver. And so people are like, all right, I'm, I'm convinced. I'm reluctantly convinced. Okay, so let's talk about the mechanics now of setting it up. It's typically a two or three step process. You don't just walk in and say, hey, we need money. Okay, that, that's like the death uh, of this whole idea. And so uh, we, we tend to do it this way, and the, the last two steps can be with or without, I suggest, with a citizens group, SWAC, SWIL, SWOOZY, you know, SWAT, storm water, and then add some letters at the end to make a, a, a word. Um, some kind of a citizens committee, 12 to 15 people, one of each kind, you know, that sort of a thing. Um, so this DIM study stands for doesn't make sense, okay? We just, I think there was beer involved when we came up with that name, but honestly, it just, it sounds really scientific and all it is is, look, does this make sense? And you just get the right people in the room and you ask smart questions. Quick and dirty, let's walk through the whole argument we'd make if there's any showstoppers, is there anything that, that uh, would cause us not to go forward, is it the wrong time, wrong place, wrong people, whatever. Um, it operates under the radar. It's city staff and a few other people, it's a counselor, it's whoever the right people in, in that community are to ask themselves this hard question, look in the mirror and see if you can do it. Um, it happens really quickly, you can do it in two weeks. I mean, just bam, you're in, you're out, and you make that decision. This keeps you from making a big public mistake 
for something that might be necessary. It also helps you plan out the next steps. The feasibility study takes a group of citizens. You typically go to uh, the counselors and you say, oh, exalted ones, we have significant growing and unresolved drainage problems. We can't solve, right? And you say, we would like you to appoint a group of citizens to help us ask and answer these six questions. What are we spending and doing now in stormwater? What are the significant problems, needs, and issues that we face? How have other people solved them? How should we solve them? What will it cost? And how should we pay for it? You can do five or six meetings. Citizens walk through this. Um, there's only been, I've been done 30 of these, I guess, and there's only been one where they said, hell no. In every other one, they said, you know, even like a business owner, a big business owner would go, you know, they're going to hate me down at the Chamber of Commerce, but honestly, this is the right thing to do. I mean, Portland, it was like almost tears. You know, they're just like, ah, oh, you know, I'm going to lose my standing in the community, but I've got to stand with you guys and say this is the right thing to do. So you get fingerprints on the knife when you do this, right? Because city council always wants other people with the murder weapon. Um, and so when you have this group and they come back to city council and say, you asked us to answer these questions, here's the answer, then city council goes, huh. So then we just come in right behind that and we look at implementation, but we never ask city council, can we have a fee? We always ask, can we go to the next step? Can we try a feasibility study? We think it makes sense. Here's the results of that. Can we go to the next step? It's like courting. You don't say, will you marry me on the first date unless you're really drunk, okay? Otherwise, you say, hey, you want to go out again? Hey, I kind of like you. You know, hey, you want to get coffee? Okay, so, so we, we do that with city councils. We're not stupid, okay? And so we say, would you be willing to go the next step? Remember when you come down a mountain, those runaway truck ramps, you know, if the brake? That's what we create. We create runaway ramps so that a counselor and a mayor can go, okay, if this thing goes off the rails, we can pull the plug, right? And you go, absolutely, you go, okay, keep going. So that allow, so we get past that hurdle of, I'm not gonna start because if I say yes here, I don't know what I'm saying yes to. They always know what they're saying yes to and they always have their finger on the on off switch. Then it becomes very, very easy to get them on board. The coursework that I use the most in life is abnormal psychology. Honestly, all that, you know, calculus, I don't use that at all. Five track process. Um, we want to get it right the first time when we set it up and there are five things we need to get right. Governance. Who's in charge? Who does what to who? Who has authority? Who does this where and who doesn't do this? We need to get that right. We need to get the program and compelling case right. That program must solve problems. When we set this up legally, we can only charge for the program we have. And that program has got to have, this is the most important thing it has to have, the day the first bill goes out, people need to open a letter, look at the bill, and then go, what's that noise? Honey, there's a backhoe solving the drainage problem on our street. Okay, you gotta have that day one because your utility has to be action oriented. You've gotta solve real problems day one, right? So, compelling case. You have to have spot on public education, involvement, information, Somebody is going to say the words rain tax, and that will make it in the papers. They will find the poorest family and the business that's almost bankrupt, and they will feature them and what this will do to them. And we have to have the right answers, the right information. And honestly, in the 11th hour, we make a lot of sausage. We just say, well, would this work for you? Okay, let's think about if we could do that. We, we just do a lot of that, right? Um, the financial policies have got to be spot on. We have to offer credits. We have to have a rate structure that works. And finally, you don't want people calling saying, what is this? And the person at the other end goes, I don't know either, mate. You know, what, what is it? You know, we have to have really good customer service. I can help you. Um, I'll send you a JPEG of your site with the impervious area. Tell me if we made a mistake. Okay? So we have to have, uh, we typically set up a website where they can go look up their fee, look up the map of their property, and go, yeah, I guess it's right. You always want the customer service person to be able to say, is that a 1978 Range Rover in your front, 
you know, I'm looking, I'm looking at the photos. Yeah, okay. Oh, you got a little fish house out back. That's amazing. Uh, never mind. You know, and they hang up, right? Because they know you have as good a data or better than they do. So we need, we need to be that, that good at it. So when we put all these together, this is a don't try this at home track. But, but all of these things work together. We start kind of here in policy and we get more and more specific. We feed information back and forth. I can't set up a rate structure if I don't know what kind of data we have. I can't set up credits if I don't know what the program concept is. If I don't know what governance is, I don't know who's going to do what to who and who needs money and who doesn't. And so these things all kind of work together. It looks complicated, but it's not that complicated. And then the first bill goes out and we're off to the races. In the US, one would set it up in one state and every single time within five years there were seven up and down you know the same area it's funny watching the first one was set up in uh, Washington Bellevue Washington and within five years 17 different communities you know within like a commute and then a commute from that commute because why they drive and say how are you solving the, you're doing well how'd you do that I want one you know it's like utility envy I want one we need to have that and and, and it just spreads like wildfire so today um, there are a few states where it's illegal uh, to do this. California is one, regrettably so, Mississippi, Alabama. Um, but in the states where it's legal, it, it just, you know, I did, uh, I and my team did five of the first 10, and now, honestly, I, I'm shocked. I go up to my home state of Minnesota, and there's 287 of them, and I have no idea how they got set up. But so it's just, it's just going like wildfire. Why? Because it solves the problem. Once I have stable, adequate, equitable funding, I can start solving stormwater problems and I can do it year in, year out, day in, day out. I'm smart enough to solve them. I just don't have a plan that is coherent and accepted, a business plan, and I don't have funding to back it up. If I get those two things, I'm off to the races. So I am sure that, that uh, it's gonna happen in Australia. There's just no question about it, it's got to. The, the level of discourse, the level of understood need is, is just, you know, I just smell it. You know, I've, I've, I've been in a lot of rodeos and, and, and I, it just, it has, I told them, the guys yesterday were meeting, I said, this feels like the, the signing of the Declaration of Independence, you know, in a way, because it's time. It's time in Australia for this to happen, so I feel really privileged to, to uh, be here. Um, so with that, um, what are your questions? What are your thoughts about this? Is, did anything occur to you where you go, what do you think of it? What do you think of it for your community? Go ahead. Somebody's got to be first. Yes. It can be. Now, the fee is not high enough to make people tear out parking lots and things like that. It's typically not high enough to make them retrofit some big expensive thing, but it is plenty high enough to make developments change the way they do imperviousness. And if your credit system is set up right, it's plenty high enough to make them change their site design objectives to, to offer credits and shared credits and that sort of a thing. Yep. And the, the credits typically are plenty to cover the maintenance cost and then some, and some sunk cost back in. Yes. I was just wondering about the balance between still maintaining for developers to have to do that sort of water quality treatment on site through the development process and then having a user pay system for a stormwater network. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is not the sediment control development process. All of this is post-development, long-term stuff. So the, the developer process would be handled with fees and inspection fees and that sort of thing. This is the long-term once we've stabilized the site. Right, great question. Anything else? Yeah. Wait. Okay. Yep. <coughs> um, yo, sure. There's 2,100. You know, there's a, there's some underachievers. Um, some uh, some horror stories are that um, they they didn't follow some of the issues here. So, for example, 
they didn't make a compelling case. Their compelling case was, we're out of money. And everybody said, me too, mate. You know, so what makes you special? Or the government is making us do this. Another horror story, sort of unaccountably, Jefferson County, Alabama, they only charged money for water quality, but the people's felt need was flooding, uh, flooding issues and collapsing infrastructure. And so when they would call this organization and say, I've got flooding in my backyard, and the answer was, we only do water quality for compliance, it just got people really ticked off. And they literally fired everybody, dissolved the thing. The county actually declared bankruptcy. And uh, yeah, so that was a, a big horror story. So the, the horror stories tend to be with cutting corners, not offering reasonable credits, and not doing what you say you're going to do. Columbus, Ohio almost lost the whole utility because their program plan was to plan for two years and then start doing things. They, they theoretically said, oh, we need a, a maintenance infrastructure inventory and asset management program and master plans, and, and then we'll know. And heck you do. You could ask nearly any citizen and certainly any street crew person, what are the 15 things you'd fix tomorrow if you had money? And they'll all tell you the same 15. Go fix those while you're planning in the background, right? You have to be out front. So those would be some of the horses. Some of them are, we don't deal with the media well, and so then they publish a rain tax thing. And if you go look up stormwater utilities or just Google rain tax, you'll see groups of people with, you know, ax the tax signs. I, I was to a public meeting in uh, South Carolina where they brought guns to the meeting. It was in a church of all places, and we, we had to open all the windows because so many people came, and so I had to shout so they could hear me outside the windows. I mean, it was like an old-time tent meeting, and you know, I was firing brimstone, might be coming down. And, but it ended up fine. Um, when we talked about exactly what this money would be for, and that it would be extraordinarily efficient, and that we, this, you weren't paying for this. No one was paying for this now. This was a service we've neglected. People kind of went, Okay, I get it, but I need a big credit, you know, that's that sort of thing. Developers like this because they don't pay the fee, right? So developers like, ha-cha, I get better service and no whammies. This is good for me. Um, there was another question. Yes? I was just going to say, um, we have uh, uh, all tiers of government here that will try and turn anything they can to consolidate revenue. Yes. Um, typically, and I don't know how your laws work here, in the U.S., in an enterprise fund, the money has to be used for the purposes that, for which the enterprise fund was created. It's a, it's a local government corporation. What communities do is they do indirect cost allocations into that enterprise fund so they can pull money out for other purposes. Nashville did that at first to pay for the stadium. I thought it was ironic that the stadium flooded to the 18th row being a large detention pond, so we got our money's worth out of that. Um, one thing that we try to do is set up a program and a capital plan that is approved ahead of time. And basically, you kind of have hell to pay to not do that capital plan. We, we try to really make it that way. We really try to get counselors to say, we will solve problems in your, di in Nashville there's 40 counselors. It's like Congress. 35 have their own little fiefdoms. We did projects in all 35 of those within two weeks of the kickoff of that utility. And so what we have to say to counselors is we will be, we will be your best friend, but don't jerk us around because if you do, this thing's going to go down. And you say that really nice and whatever. And I know here as in the States, there are certain communities where you have strong leaders who call all the shots and they see every stream of income as sort of their personal favor doing, I mean, they do good things, but they also do favors. And I don't know if there's ways to prohibit that. Uh, you, we've tried in the ordinance to allocate dollars 
in the ordinance itself, so much money would go to this, so much. When we set up Northeast Iowa Regional Sewer District, we had mandatory legal policies on how money would be dispersed. Sometimes a regional agency can solve that, that services a number of local governments. The problem is that the local government goes, so we're all paying, but how do I know I'll get my share? How do I know you'll be as responsive to my needs as I'll be? And so when we set up Cleveland, we literally said, this money is at your discretion. This pot of money is your local pot to use at your discretion. It has to follow these following criteria. If you violate these, no pot next year. And that worked well. So there, there are ways and means, but it's not always easy in the small town context. Yes? Yeah. <clears throat> I, think, I think it should be a creature of local government. And each local government who would like to fund their program should do it. I don't think it should be a creature of the state, necessarily. Um, it may be several local governments together. And they themselves decide what the money should go for and how much they should spend. So you're in an arid area and they're like, look, we're all about water conservation here. We're going to spend a lot of money in that. You're down in a flooded area that's got decaying infrastructure, and they're saying water conservation is great. Our first issue is to resolve our infrastructure issues. So everybody makes their own decision about it. So it's not a, what I like about it is, at least in the States, it's not been a top down where you have a large, you know, multi, multi, multi city organization that's collecting money and inefficiently distributing it. No, this is a creature of local government. Yeah, any other questions? Yes, sir. Have you observed the role of demonstration sites for things like extreme daylighting, which isn't common here yet? Uh huh. Expensive and you know, some contaminated land or services and lots of complications. I get the impression a lot of local governments want to see someone else do it first and we work in demonstration sites before they're willing to invest. Yes, so. Uh, <laughs> So we were talking to the mayor this morning, but typically there's a, in the states, often what's happened is some other organization will fund a small community to, to try a stormwater utility. Chicopee, Massachusetts. They got funded by US EPA. EPA wisely said, this is our best, best management practice, is to pay for all the other best management practices with reliable funding. This is our best, you know, stormwater quality treatment which is to solve the problem, the institutional problem. So they paid for Chicopee Mass's utility to be set up lock, stock, and barrel. Um, in Florida, they gave grants to every, any community want to set one up, they'd give them a, a grant to, do, to help you know, pay half the cost of it. Because they knew problems would be solved once it's set up. Um, oftentimes, a wastewater utility will do an interfund loan to set it up to the enterprise fund, the stormwater enterprise fund, who then pays it back. Uh, to the wastewater utility later so you can get past this where does the money come from at the beginning sort of a thing. We're hoping that there will be seed money in all the various parts of Australia to try some of these out different places. That, that's our hope. Thing. Okay, thank you very much. I'll be around uh, later as well.